Thank you very much. So, <laughs> I don't want to forget here that our worship team won a pretty big contest this last week. Yeah. Yeah, big old, big old contest uh, regarding worship and some... Look, I'm excited about a $2,000 travel credit we're not paying for you to travel to this conference. So, <clears throat> and, and, and everything else, amen. So, hey, how you guys doing today? Oh, cool. Six of you are good. So, so everybody else, I'm guessing the gloomy weather is just kind of like, you ever wake up on a rainy day and you're like, ah, oh, man. So last night I, I thought, you know, I've, I, I've been kind of running on fumes lately. I've been, I've been long days, long weeks, and, and I love it, but I've been hitting this point where, like, I just can't go too much longer without sleep. I was in bed at like 10 after 10 last night, which for some of you might be like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I was, I was just so wiped out. And I thought, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to sleep. I, I was out, you know what I mean? Woke up one time to go to the bathroom. I woke up again. It was like 6 a.m. And I woke up. I just rolled out of bed and I was like, yes, I feel so good. It's raining. What's going on? Here's the thing. And I, and I talked about this just when we were praying about coming into the presence of God. It, it literally does not matter what you have to bring through the doors as long as you, it's what we call the BYB principle, Okay. Bring your behind. Just get your butt to church. That's all that matters. Let God take care of the rest. Amen? But he needs you here. He needs you in the presence of his people, fellowshipping with his people, your church family, to minister to you in a special way. That doesn't mean God can't minister to you individually or, or at home when you're by yourself. Those moments are super important, too. Those moments are very important. But there's nothing that can ever replace corporate fellowship and worship. Amen? Amen? That's why family dinners are so awesome. You can have lunch by yourself anytime. Gathering at the family table for dinner, supper, whatever is so important. Amen? All right. So as we're, as we're preparing to jump into our third week here, the Reset Series, so important. What, what really was just sort of burdening me, especially as we're just getting started here as a church together, you and I, as we're, as we're just kicking this thing off, that we go back to basics. We go back to foundational beliefs. We have to look at... Our, our, our thoughts, do we need to reset the way that we think? Our actions, do we reset our, our, our patterns, our behaviors? How about our beliefs, our spiritual beliefs? How important is it that we reset what it is that we think that we believe? Because our belief drives our action, amen? You don't do what you don't believe in. That's crazy. But what you actually believe in is evidenced by the things that you do in your life. And so what if we need to reset according to the gospel standard? According to who God is, who his son is, what that means to us, what does he expect from us? What does he expect from us, you know, as a church, as individual believers? What does God want from us? We need to reset our minds, our thinkings, our heart according to what the gospel says. First week we looked at the church. What is the church? What is not the church, right? Last week we talked about what was known as the triune God, the Holy Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, I know what you're thinking. It was pizza, chicken wings, and college football. That's not, that's the other Holy Trinity, okay? Any college football fans in here? Last night was amazing, Hunter. Ama it, was, it was Miami and Florida. I won't bore you. Literally, I'm getting dead stares about college football. So all I can tell you folks is that when Notre Dame season starts, pray for me. Okay. Hunter's a Clemson fan. We're still praying for him. If you know the history between Clemson and the Irish, you'll know why he needs Jesus. Okay. <laughs> this week we're talking specifically about I'm what I'm going to say are hot button topics, okay? Now, I don't do a lot of drama and controversy in church, but these are issues that will literally divide folks right down the middle of the aisle. And I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes, but these are, these are issues that we really need to talk about. Provenient grace and personal choice. And then what we call justification, regeneration, and adoption. Now these may sound, some of you may be familiar with these terms. Some of you may say, what in the world is he talking about? We're going we're to discuss it, and we're going to talk why it's so important. Why it's so important to understand these terms. But before we do, let's pray. God, would you open our hearts. Open our mic. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Hearts willing and open to receive all that you have for us, Lord. This is foundational, but it's so, so important. Jesus, meet us in this place. We need you now. In your precious name, Lord. Amen. So we're going to talk first. Provenient grace and personal choice. These are 
Big time words, especially, especially those with a Wesleyan heritage. So let's talk about it. What is, the, what is our official position? What do we believe and why? We believe that humanity's creation in the image of God included the ability to choose between right and wrong, right? God told Adam and Eve, you can do anything you want, just don't eat from this tree. They made that choice, right? Thus, individuals were made morally responsible for their choices. But since the fall of Adam, people are unable in their own strength to do the right. This is due to what we call original sin, okay, original sin, which is reproduced naturally in Adam's descendants. Because of it, in it being sin, because of that original sin, humans are very far gone from original righteousness and by nature are continually inclined to evil. They cannot of themselves even call upon God or exercise faith for salvation. But through Jesus Christ, the prevenient grace, right, prevenient grace of God makes it possible what humans in self-effort cannot do. It is bestowed freely upon all, enabling, listen, all who will, enabling all who will, in other words, all who will decide, to turn and be saved. Now, here's the thing. People can make scriptural or, or, or biblical or God-induced statements all day long. The question is, how do you substantiate it? How do you prove what you say is true? Anybody here ever have to, you know, interview and hire new employees, right? How fun is that? Turns out, two-thirds of your resume is a lie. Wish you had led with that, right? I once hired a guy. I was running a... a, a uh, a tutoring center. I was, the, I was the director of a tutoring center. Now, here's the thing. When your kids are struggling and you come and meet with me, I'm going to charge you $50 an hour for private tutoring, okay? And I sold a lot of tutoring hours, but it's really hard to sell something that doesn't have quality behind it, right? So I had to hire a very certain, real special kind of teacher. Found a kid. He was great. He was great with the kids. He was amazing. He had an undisclosed DUI on his application. Now, here's the problem. There's a box, real small. Have you ever been convicted of a particular crime? Check yes or check no. Now, if you check yes, it's okay because we can talk through that. Because what happened was not actual, I mean, it's, it's a big deal, it's serious. But what happened could have been talked and walked through. But what box do you think he checked? He checked no. That's an automatic disqualifier, right? That's why honesty is, is so important. You have to be able to substantiate the things that you claim are true. Where else ought we go but scripture? Nowhere else, period. That's the only place we're ever going to go to talk about anything that we ever talk about up here. Amen? I don't care about opinions and thoughts and beliefs. I don't care how long you've been in the tradition of faith, where you grew up, what your parents told you, what your grandma prayed for you. If it ain't in scripture, it ain't in this church. Got it? Okay. So here's what we're going to talk about, the idea of provenient grace. This is a hot-button topic, and let me tell you why. Provenient grace literally describes when we couldn't help ourselves, God stepped in to help us, right? And this is in Ephesians 2. I'm looking at verses 4 and 5 and also verses 8 and 9. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead but in our, our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Listen, and this is a very important scripture. You've heard it before. For by grace you have been saved through faith, right? And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. Some people love to take credit for the things that God has done in their life, right? How about this one? You have the most beautiful children. Thank you. <laughs> Fool, you didn't have anything to do with it. That's chromosomes working. Yeah, technically you were there. Your kids are so smart. I know. What? I've had a conversation with you. You have nothing to do with that, okay? <laughs> we love to take credit for things sometimes that have nothing to do with us. But in this case, the Bible makes it very clear. By grace, through faith, his works, not yours. Don't even try and take credit for it. Amen? And the thing that I will always say about our salvation, you're going to hear this a lot. You can't earn it, learn it, or burn it, okay? It's nothing you can earn. You can't work for it. Yes, there are things that God expects you to do, but you can never earn your salvation. You can't learn it in a book. I don't care how many college degrees you've got, and I've got a bunch of them. They're absolutely useless almost, okay? You can't learn it in a book. You can learn about learning about God's word, but you can't, be, you can't learn about God's word unless you spend time in it. You can't learn about the character of God unless you spend time with him. You can't learn about the spirit of God unless you experience it in you. Does that make sense? 
You can't earn it. You can't learn it. And finally, listen, you can't burn it. There's nothing that you can do that will make God say, enough. I can't take any more of you. You're done. You've screwed up too bad. Now, I absolutely believe that you can choose to walk away. God loves us enough to give us a choice to respond in love. He also gives us a choice to step away. But you've got to be pretty far gone for something like that. And even in those circumstances, God can redeem us. Amen? So, provenient grace. Now, another place that I'm going to look at is in Titus. Because it's really important that there's substantial scriptural support here. Titus 3, 4 through 7. Listen. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, and we're going to talk about that soon, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but what it's saying is nothing you did qualified you for the grace of God. It's because of his mercy, right? Because of his mercy, and we're saved. And why is this important? Why is the notion of provenient grace so important? Here's why. Because of his grace, we moved from death to life, okay? Because of his grace, our eternal destiny changes upon our decision to cooperate with the will of God. Amen? Now, y'all don't look excited enough about this I'm over here. Okay, so look, I'm talking to this side for a second. Your eternal destiny has changed because of the grace of God. You went from death to life simply because he said, I love you and I'm going to do this for you. Now, they're a little more excited. I hope you're paying attention over here, okay? Now, we're all going to go through this together, but provenient grace is so, so important. Because when we were dead in sin, when we were dead to the world, actually in 2 Corinthians it says that the God of this world, right, Satan has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. Sometimes you don't even know what you don't know until you realize you don't know it. You come up against it and you realize, wow. Let's move on to personal choice. Again, these are hot button topics and we're about to figure out why. Bless you. Personal choice. We absolutely believe that we have the choice to obey or disobey God. To respond to his call or not. Listen to this in James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, these are action words. Now, here's an unpopular saying in church. Action equals accountability. What if, just what if, the choices that you make, God is going to hold you accountable for? What if the way you act, he's going to say, why are you doing that? Oh, no, 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 I'm saved. It's okay. No, it's not. Action equals accountability. We are held accountable for the actions that we perform. An employee in the workplace is going to be held accountable for their actions, right? How many of you get to go to work and do whatever you want and collect a paycheck anyway? How much more important is the salvation of our souls? And it's not, again, we're not saying that you can earn it, and there's nothing you can do to, to work for the love of God, but there are certain things. If you call yourself a child of God, a follower of God, your behavior needs to at some point align with that which we say that we are. How about this, Hebrews eleven six? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever, listen, would draw near to God. Again, that's our action. Whoever would draw near to God must believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, this is not the kind of mental assent or, or verbal acquiescence that some of us are sometimes guilty of. In the book of James, it also says, you say you believe in God. Good, even the demons believe. The devil himself knows that God is real. The belief that it's talking about here is to place confidence in things believed. It's one thing to say you believe it. It's another thing to put your confidence in it. I've seen a number of stories about these, these high-rise high, high rise tightrope walkers. Do you believe I can do this? Yes. Do you have confidence in my ability? Yes. Who will let me push them in a wheelbarrow across the tightrope? No! No! Not going to happen. What do you place your confidence in? To place your confidence means, I believe in this so much to the point, I'm willing to step out and do something about it. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Lord, I'll go wherever you send me, even if it's Africa, Missouri, yeah, Phoenix. God. 
help me. If you ever get the chance to visit Phoenix, pass, hard pass. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Do you realize the connection there? It is our faith, our, our, our actions, our confidence placed in that which we say we believe that actually pleases God. It's not what we bring to the table. It's our, simply, it's our willingness to take him at his word. How much does it delight you as a parent to hear your child say, I believe in you. I trust you. Think about that. That's what delights God. That's what pleases him. And it is our aim, it's our action, it's our goal, it's the thesis of our life that we would be holy and pleasing to God. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? That's our spiritual act of worship. So the key with personal choices is what we place our confidence in. And I want to, before we move on to the next piece, which is, which is a little weightier, I want to say this. I, I've been kicking this around the last few weeks. At the end of this series, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all my notes for the entire five or six weeks, and I'm going to combine them. Because I've covered a lot of ground, a lot of scripture, a lot of foundational stuff. I'm going to put it all together. I asked Carrie, I said, hey, do you think people would be interested? And she said, well, maybe. <laughs> but I do want to make it available just in case because I cover a lot. And because I don't publish the scriptures in the bulletin, uh, maybe you write them down, maybe you don't. But I want people to always be able to point back to this source material and say, what was he talking about? Okay, so I'm just, I'm going to have that available. Now, let's move into the big three. Justification, regeneration, adoption. This is all really important stuff. I know what you're thinking. Pastor, you just said that about the last section. You're right. That's all really important stuff too. Hopefully all you ever hear is that which is really important, eternally beneficial for your souls up here, right? I don't have a lot of time. I get, I get, you know, maybe 45 minutes on a Sunday morning. I really want to make it count. I'm not up here to waste time. I I, I literally want to spend my life on behalf of eternal investment and long-term significance for people. Amen? That's what's important to me. That's what's important to me. I turned 40 in like a week and a half, and all of a sudden, and I know before you roll your eyes, Hunter, shut up, I see you. Before you think, some people say you're just getting started. Other people say, wow, you're one foot in the grave. Wherever I am, something about that, that transitional period, Aisley was our last baby. That's our last child. We're, 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 we're turning the page. It's a new chapter of we're no longer uh, uh, young enough to have kids and we're no longer having kids anymore. That chapter of our life is closed. So God, what is it that you got next? And he does have something. But a lot of times transitioning from one season to another means you have to let go of what you're act, where you're at and what you're actually holding on to. So God can say, I know that's not what you always wanted. And I know that that's a dream of your heart, but I need you to let it go so you can walk in the thing that I've got for you that believe it or not, as much as it hurts, it's even better than what you want for yourself right now. And only he knows that, only he can offer that. Justification, regeneration, adoption. Here's our official statement or position, if you will, on what these things are. We believe that when one repents of personal sin and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, that at the same moment, that person is justified, regenerated, adopted into the family of God and assured of personal salvation. How do you like that word assured, right? Assured of personal salvation through the witness of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about exactly what that means. But it's really important that we define these terms, and more important than defining them, substantiate them in Scripture. Amen? So, so many people will throw you all kinds of crazy, well, I believe God says this, and I believe God does that. I hope that your response is, where in the Bible does it say that? How many times has someone told you, told you, you know, God helps those who help themselves? Garbage. Well, you know, the good book says, I don't know what book you're reading, but that's not in the Bible. If something doesn't sound right to you, call it out. If something doesn't resonate with you, pray it out. If something doesn't feel right to you, check it out. Make sense? Never, ever, ever let somebody tell you anything. Any preacher worth his salt should stand in front of you and say, don't take my word for it. Check it out yourself. That's why you'll always see when there's statements like this, I'm going to say, here's where it says in a scripture. Whenever I share with you a scripture, you're going to see it on, down below. I want you to look at this stuff. That's why I want to provide my notes at the end. There's like, we cover a ton. Let's talk about the first one, justification. This is an important word. This is our official position and where it comes from. 
We believe that justification is the judicial act of God, and I'll talk about that in a minute, whereby a person is accounted righteous, granted full pardon of all sin, delivered from guilt, completely released from the penalty of sins committed by the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by faith alone, not on the basis of works. To be justified is literally to be set free from the penalty of sin. Why is it a judicial act of God? You see, in the Old Testament, God said, I'll make a covenant with you. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Well, that word covenant, what he was actually saying, it was a legally binding document between man and God. So in Malachi, he can, Malachi chapter 3, he says, I am not a man that I should lie. In other words, you can count on what I say. You can trust that what I say I mean, and you can literally take it to the bank because it's an actual legally binding covenant between man and God. And so in the New Testament where where Jesus, it says that he fulfilled the law, right? He fulfilled the ultimate sacrifice, this judicial act of God, because Romans tells us what? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It also tells us that the penalty of sin is death. And not everybody's as excited about that one, right? How about justification that the judicial act of God to make us right before him? Romans 5 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, there it is again, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith, right? It's there, and in faith we need to access it, into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It says it right there, we have been justified by faith. God has done the work and asks us by faith to step into it, right? Not to mentally acquiesce, but to step into it, to place confidence in the thing that he says he did for us. How do you know that your confidence is in your justification? What steps do you take in the name of following Jesus? Maybe you grew up in a house, growing up in a house. Maybe you come from a family where you look around you and say, you know, this isn't me. This isn't who I want to be. I want different for my life. Now, if you, if you came from a, a good, n- normal-ish family, Sarah's family is so normal, it's strange, okay? There's like no skeletons in the closet. I've looked, okay? <laughs> they are just nice, normal people. It freaks me out. But maybe that's not your experience. Maybe you grew up in, in a home that put the fun in dysfunctional. Maybe you grew up in a place where you were miserable and alone all the time. My first thoughts of suicide were at about 10 years old. Maybe that's your story. But I say all that to say this, no matter where you came from, the destination that God has in mind for you is a whole lot better than where you started. Yeah, I'm preaching better than you're letting on right now. I hope you go home over lunch and go, that's what pastor meant. Therefore, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through Christ. Peace with God. That's literally a peace that sits in your soul that you could come before the Lord and say, it is well. It's well because you're in charge. It's well because you're in control. It is well because nothing I can do can change that which is in your hands as much as we might like to change it. All I can do is put it in his hands. That's justification and the Bible makes it very clear. Justification has been provided for us by God. Let's talk about regeneration. This one's going to sting a little bit, I think. We believe that regeneration, or what's called the new birth, is that work of the Holy Spirit whereby when one truly repents and believes, one's moral nature is given a a distinctively spiritual life with the, listen, capacity for love and obedience. The capacity, it's something you grow into, right? This new life is received by faith in Christ, listen, It enables the pardoned sinner to serve God with the will and affections of the heart. And by it, the regenerate are delivered from the power of sin, which reigns over all the regenerate. Now, that's a lot to process. So let's talk through. This is in the book of Ezekiel. Now, you've heard other scriptures before. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, right? The old is Put on hold. The old is uh, uh, somewhat close by and accessible when you want to know. It says the old is, come on, Pastor Allen, what does it say? The old is gone. The old is gone, passed away. The new has come. Now, what that means is that if the old is gone and the new has come, when I want to do the old, I got to go look for it. I got to go dig it up. 
i got to purposely step back into the old which God has called me away from. And let's be honest, sometimes I'm more than willing to jump into that sin, right? Jesus' own followers, three days after he's dead, where are they? On a fishing boat. He said, I call you away from this life. It happens. We have to go back for it. But the word makes it very clear. The old is gone, the new is coming. Here it is in Ezekiel. I like this. Ezekiel 36. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Listen, verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all idols. I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now here's something I don't hear talked about very often. When we come to Christ, he says, we have a new heart in it. I mean, Ezekiel says, I'll put in you a new heart and a new spirit. you got new flesh. And yet, Galatians 5 says, you know, to walk in the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It says, against these things there is no law, Right? Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now, if God guarantees that when I walk with him, he puts a new heart and a new spirit inside of me, why is it that, that I don't tend to walk in that capacity for love and obedience? Why is it that with the spirit of God inside of me, I can still be a jerk? I cannot bear fruit. I cannot look like a Christian. People would question, oh, he's actually a believer. Now, how does that happen? I would posit, I would assert that it has entirely to do with the choices that we make. That the way we act in response to the call of God directly determines our spiritual development. Now, it's not very popular because what we like to think in church is, no, 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 I'm saved, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I don't have to do anything else, there's nothing else required of me. I raise my hand, pray the prayer, punch my get out of hell free card, and move on with life. And I had a pastor, he put it this way, we like to sprinkle a little Jesus on top and make it well. That's not the way it works. That's just not the way it works. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, I will give you a new spirit, I will put it in with you, and I will remove your heart of stone, and from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So he puts it all in there. What happens to it? You got two, two people warring inside of you. There's the spirit guy and the flesh, right? Now, when I feed the spirit guy, he grows. So I, I want to walk in the will and way of God, right? Psalm 109, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. That's verse 9. Verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, right? I'm taking active, action-oriented steps to make sure that I feed this spirit guy. But then there's this other guy. Sometimes you'll see it personified as like a devil and an angel on your shoulder, right? Can I, can I adjust your thinking? It's a devil on each shoulder, okay? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Well, this option's terrible, and so's that one. And geez, who's on my side here? When it comes to your flesh, nobody. It's the Spirit of God inside of you that says, no, 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 no. That's, that's not the way we want to go. In the book of Hebrews, it says, land that continuously drinks in the rain, but produces no fruit useful for the one farming it. It says that land is what? Useless. Jesus, it says in John 15, if a branch bears no fruit, it's hacked off and thrown into the fire. Now, here's the thing I'll tell you, because I don't want to scare you. If you have the capacity to worry about whether or not you're producing the fruit God wants, you're in the right place, okay? And I don't even need a show of hands, but, but, I, but I want you to think about this for a second. How many of you on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, minute-by-minute basis have to think, Lord, is this okay? Am I okay? Are we all right? <laughs> Am I doing the things I'm supposed to be doing? What are the things, you know, David said it himself in the Psalms, search out in me, you know, create in me a clean heart, but show me my sin. Show me that which is offensive to you. 
Help me understand what hurts you, God. When I think about you know, the story like in Genesis 6.6, it says that God was hurt, he was, he was pained in his heart that he had made mankind because of, all the, because of all their wickedness. He was pained in his heart because of what the choices of people had become. So when we talk about regeneration, God gives us a heart to be regenerated. But it's up to us to put in the work. Why do some people have bodybuilders' physiques? Because they build their bodies. Why do some people have, you know, body by buffet? I don't know. <laughs> Guess what? Building the body. You can get on the scale and argue with the scale all you want, but guess what? That number is that number. Why do we think that we can argue with God? Argue sitting up in church like, no, 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 that's not me. You ever hear a message so good that you just really wished your neighbor was there to hear it? Your family? Do you know, can I just tell you something? Do you know how often from up here I see spouses elbowing one another? I am not kidding. Yeah, some of you know who I'm talking about in the back, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I see it all the people elbowing each other all the time. You know how rare it is I see, I see a husband turn to a wife and say, he's, he's talking about me. And she says, yeah, I know. <laughs> you can't argue with the scale. You really can't argue with the word of God. But the good news is he puts that heart in us and he's, he, he's waiting. He's waiting for us. It said in James 4, 8, draw near to God. That's the actual step on our part. And it says that he'll do what? He will drawn near to you. He's there. He's, how close does God have to be? All you have to do is turn around and reach out to him and he's right there for you. How close does God have? Who's really doing the work in the equation there? God is, right? That's what's important. Let's talk about finally the most exciting piece, I think, and that's adoption. It says, we believe that adoption is the act of God by which the justified and regenerated, right? We, we talked about justification, regeneration, right? So those of us, the justified, and regenerated believer becomes a partaker of all the rights, privileges, and responsibility of a child of God. This is where he does the work and now says, come benefit from the results. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as, listen, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. Now, that's a whole other word. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according. Ladies, this includes you too. Don't, don't feel left out. Through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has, uh, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is for everyone. Adopted into the family of God literally means you now have a place at the table. You join the right family. Anybody ever been a part of the wrong family? I'm not, Sarah, I'm not looking at you. That's not what I'm saying. Her family feels like, well, who is this guy? <laughs> I broke all the rules when Sarah and I got married. I broke them all. I came from a much different kind of family. She was in a good family. I, I came with all kinds of just baggage and junk. They didn't have any of that. I had all kinds of issues and, uh, and, and anger and unworked through stuff that I brought to this family. And you know what they did? You know what they had the nerve to do? Can you believe this? They accepted me just as I was. I mean, who does that? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, we eloped. Bad idea, okay? Can I just tell you, if you're thinking about, if you ever think about eloping or someone suggests it, you smack them on the top of their head, okay? Not a good idea. Parents, raise your hand if you amen with me on that one. Yes, bad idea. Carrie raised two hands. Okay, good. The family of God. This, this is where, that's evidence because, was it rough? Yeah, we had, we had a rocky couple of first years. I was not quite as humble as I am today. Wow. 
No comment. Yeah, no comment. <laughs> These people had the nerve to invite me into their family and treat me like a family member. Can you imagine such a thing? It's a gift. How much more so is being a part of the family of God? How much more so is being invited to your heavenly father's table to join him? And he says, I want to be in fellowship with you. I want you. I don't just love you. I like you. I created you the way you are. And who you are is good enough for me. Who we are is good enough for God. And there's nothing we could ever do that will make him love us more than he does right this moment. Amen? And I feel like that's a truth that we just... We gotta walk in. We have to walk in that truth. If we don't believe that we have been justified and we now stand before God in, in, in cleanliness, that we've been regenerated, that He's given us a new heart that we can grow in, that we've been adopted into a new family that may or may not be, look anything like the family that we come from, but is better than anything we've ever experienced. If we don't believe that, we'll never walk in it. If we don't walk in it, we are cheating ourselves of the full blessing that God has intended for our lives. And that's what's so important. And I'm going to ask KZ to come up because I, I, I am such a firm believer in, in, in taking the opportunity to respond to what we hear on a Sunday morning. The worst thing I could ever do, the worst thing I could ever do is to simply throw it out there and say, good luck with it. I hope this means something to you. Do what you got. Do what you got to do. Do what you can. Do what you want. I, I just, I, I really, 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 really believe that God wants to restore some people in this church. We prayed specifically for a community that we could come and minister to to families, we could minister to broken people, we could see broken things fixed, people restored, families regenerated. You know what I'm saying? Anybody ever been there? You ever ever feel like, man, I'm fractured or I'm broken or I'm on the outside, I'm not whole, I'm not complete, I got all these, these missing pieces, whatever it is. If you've ever been there, that's what I'm preaching for today. That's what I'm praying for every day. That's what I'm working towards in in, in my own role, my own calling in trying to cooperate with the calling of God. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. You could be anywhere on a Sunday morning. You chose to come into the house of God and I want to honor that time that you spend here by honoring him, amen? So I want to pray real quick for everyone before we enter into one last song of worship. I want everybody to come into a place of reflection right now. All across this room, every single person, please just bow your head and close your eyes. Everybody, no cheating. Because I want to pray for, I want to pray for you today. Now I'm asking a couple of specific questions right now. And if this is not you, you don't need to respond. But I need to know in this room who I can pray for. I need to know, I need to know who needs to get right with Jesus. Anybody else? Just show me your hand real quick. Nobody peek. Just show me your hand. Thank you. Thank you. I want to help you get right with Jesus. Thank you. I want to see people restored to the thing that God has called them to be. Me too. Me too, okay? To, you know, they say to teach us to learn twice, to preach us to learn it a hundred times all week long, to chew on this stuff, to think about it, to pray for it. I just I want to give you the opportunity to tell God exactly what you're thinking. Good or bad, that's what God wants. He can take it. But the other side of that is, would you be willing to listen to what he has to say to you? Here's what I want you to do. If you need to get your heart right, when we worship this morning, I want you to pour it all out to him. I also, if you didn't do so already, want you to fill out one of those blue cards, those connect cards, and let know on the back what your prayer request you don't have to put your name on it. Please fill it out and, and just give it to somebody at the end of service, somebody at the back doors or even myself. Please let me pray for you. Please. I want to pray for you. Jesus, is, we're, we're going to worship. We're going to just one more song, Lord. Would you speak to our hearts now? Those who you're calling, call us, God. Give us the choice to respond to you, Lord. We repent for the wicked condition of our hearts, for whatever junk that we've brought through the doors this morning, God. You ask us to put it at your feet. Lord, would you help us do that now? Meet us in this place, Jesus, please. I'm gonna ask you all to stand as we worship one more song together.
please, please, if you can let me pray for you. Fill out one of those cards. I'd love to see it. Let's worship together. read you something out of Psalm 33. I want you to hear this. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Okay, that's us. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth, for he forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. I like this. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. The horse is vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. Verse 18. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Pray with me. God, there is no redemption apart from you. There's no salvation apart from you. There's not even hope apart from you, Lord. There is nothing without you. God, it says that you consider from heaven the hearts of those that love you and fear you and want to be with you. Jesus, that's us. We put our hearts before you this morning and say, all that we are, take. All that we'll ever be, build. All that we ever were, forgive. All that we can be, restore. All that's broken, would you fix? All that's hurting, would you heal? All your people love. All our hopes and dreams and fears minister to. Be with us now in this place, Jesus. For those that respond to you and say, Lord, I need to get right. Jesus, would you speak to their hearts this morning? Lord, I lift up each and every single person that raised their hand for prayer. Lord, I lift up those that wanted to and didn't. I just know, God, that nothing can happen apart from you, Jesus. As you are healing this church, God, you are bringing restoration and wholeness to this body and your people, God. We put it in your hands and say it's not by anybody's work but yours. It's not by anybody's hand but yours. It's not through anybody's love but yours, Jesus. We love you. We bless your name this morning. 
Thank you, God, for all that you do. And all God's people together said, amen. As you go from this place, that's a, you know, the benediction part of a service. It's literally that as you go from here. Remember that God's grace stepped in and saved you and you were dead to yourself. Your personal choices affect the shape, the trajectory, the outcome of your life on a day-to-day basis. You have been justified and made right with God. He has regenerated that old dead thing inside of you to make new and adopted you into a family where you are loved unconditionally. Amen? Don't just believe it. Share it with somebody this week. Amen? And I'll see you all until we can be together again. I love you. Stay safe. If you filled out one of those Connect cards, please give it to somebody on your way out. God bless you all. Bye-bye.